prophets have spoken of him from the beginning of time. He is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He is our high priest, the Lion of Judah, the child born in a manger, the coming King. He is Emmanuel. Well, good morning, church family. Hope you had an amazing Thanksgiving and certainly glad to be with you this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. That is the last book in your Bible. If you do not have a Bible, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that Bible, keep it, make it a gift from us to you so that you can have a copy of God's Word. Hold your spot there in Revelation 1. Look at this verse on the screen, 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as to what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. Have you meditated on that verse before? What will fix us in the end? Seeing him, beholding him as he is. You see, to see is to be transformed. Seeing is becoming. There is a poignant scene in the movie Talladega Nights. Now, I didn't know you never thought you would use that word with that movie. Yeah, a 2006 juvenile satire, all right? I was right up my alley. Ricky Bobby is a NASCAR driver, okay? And he is praying over Thanksgiving meal. And he begins to pray to little baby Jesus, okay? Six pound, nine ounce baby Jesus. And his wife stops him in the middle and says, listen, why are you doing that? And he says, I like the Christmas Jesus best. And I am saving grace, so I get to pray to him. And his wife says, listen, just do it good because we want God to let us win the race tomorrow. And then Cal, that is Ricky Bobby's teammate, chimes in and says, I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt because he's formal, but he likes to party. And I like to party, and I like my Jesus to party. Now, before you get upset, <laughs> please note, okay, they aren't mocking Jesus. Rather, our propensity to mold Jesus into whatever image we desire. I share that illustration with us at Christmas because we must not only see the baby in the manger, but rather we must tie the baby to the eternal king who reigns. The helpless babe born in a manger is the lion from the tribe of Judah. The peasant child greeted by shepherds will come again riding on the clouds to behold him as he is, is to be transformed. So this Christmas, I'm inviting us to do something a little different, a little unique, and that is we are gonna comb through the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, there are five portraits, images, pictures of the exalted Christ. So instead of us saying, I like to picture Jesus as, and then fill in the blank, we find that scripture has already filled in the blank. 
and given us appropriate starting points and images, the unveiling for us of true reality, Emmanuel revealed. So listen with me as I read in Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. I'm going to read 12 through the end of the chapter. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. John is speaking. John is writing to us. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to his feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it had been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his hand upon me, saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore, write these things which you have seen, and write the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw on my right hand, And the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, your word tells us that right now we see dimly as in a mirror. But Father, we do confess that When we can see, when the light does break through, you transform us. And to see you and to behold you is our greatest good. We desire to see you this morning. Show us your glory. That is through the work of your Holy Spirit. Father, we we get so distracted, so blinded by by circumstance, by our own emotion, and and by, by things of our heart that pull us sideways and horizontally rather than vertically. Lift our head and Father, please, through your spirit, allow us to see your son in his magnificence. Captivate us and change us for the glory of your name we pray. Amen. John the Apostle has been exiled on the island of Patmos for his testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, if you were here with us last week as we were closing the account of Acts, you might recall that intense persecution broke out under Nero when Paul and Peter were executed. It is now three decades later and Rome is at the height of its power. And Domitian is Caesar. He too, like Nero, has made it his aim to persecute Christians. The church throughout the empire is feeling the hard press because they refuse to worship Caesar. John is now the former pastor in Ephesus. And he will live out the rest of his days exiled on Patmos, away from his family and church. Patmos is a very small, rugged island. It's only six by 10 miles across in dimension. And it is 40 miles southwest of Ephesus. It was used by the Romans uh, for exile, similar to Alcatraz, if you think about that. 
There's very little food and little sleep, and those who are sent there are sentenced to hard labor. John, because of his age, who is probably in his 80s at this point, he is allowed some leniency, and from time to time, he does have visitors. It is Sunday morning. John no longer has a congregation to get up and to preach for, but he still gets up and worship, just like he has faithfully for decades. He can still pray and sing and read God's word. And in the quiet, he is startled by a booming voice that comes behind him and tells him to write down what he sees and send it to the churches. Now a portrait of the exalted Christ is about to be unveiled for us. This morning we will comb through that vision twice. And with this first pass, we are going to see that Jesus is the heavenly high priest. John turns to see the voice, but first he sees that there are seven lampstands. The scene is in the heavenly temple. Exodus 25 records for us uh, that, uh, about how Moses was supposed to uh, put together the seven-branched lampstand in the tabernacle. John's vision is different in that the seven that there are seven separate lampstands. Now, it was the priest's duty to never let the menorah uh, in the holy place extinguish. So night and day, it must be kept. It must continue to give off light because the light represents God's holy presence. We are told in Revelation 1 verse 20 that the lampstands represent the seven churches that John is writing to. And one of these is Ephesus, right? He knows them quite well and personally, John's home church. Verse 13, and in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. The Son of Man is Jesus' favorite title for himself. On one level, because it highlights his humanity, his incarnation, that the eternal one took on flesh, became like Adam, like you and me, Emmanuel, God with us. But on another level, Son of Man is a title from a magnificent scene way back in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. John's scene draws heavily on Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to read it a little later in the sermon. But here, I need to set up the context of what's going on in Daniel's vision. Daniel has just seen a horrifying vision about beasts and coming kingdoms. The future for Daniel is terrifying. He has been losing sleep over it. But suddenly he sees another vision, a greater vision, one that is actually able to triumph over all of his fears. Daniel sees the Ancient of Days in a courtroom but seated on his throne in the courtroom. And the Ancient of Days is about to judge every living thing. He's about to open the books and render eternal verdicts. When suddenly, one like a son of man comes up riding on the clouds and approaches the throne. And then the Son of Man is presented before the Ancient of Days, and he is given dominion and glory and a kingdom. We will come back to the scene, but for now you need to understand the Son of Man is a title from Daniel chapter 7. 
Verse 13 again. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to his feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. Jesus is being presented as the high priest. Six out of seven Old Testament references to a robe reaching down to the feet are a description of the apparel of the high priest. And then you add to that the golden sash across his chest. Jesus is the great high priest. He is in the heavenly temple and he is tending to the lampstands, which are each church. Now, the significance of this is powerful. That is, he is a high priest that tends to his church. In the scene, he is not far away. He is not over. Rather, he is in the midst of her. In the letters that will follow that are written to the seven churches, we see how this plays out. That is that Jesus knows each church personally. He understands every trial that they are enduring. He is the great high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows what it means to suffer. And he offers grace to help in our time of need. He will write to the church in Smyrna, I know about your tribulation. It's reminiscent of when he met the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road and said to him, why are you persecuting me when Paul was persecuting the churches? Likewise, Jesus will encourage the churches. He writes to Ephesus, you have persevered and endured for my name's sake. He is lifting their heads by admitting, right, that he sees what you are doing well. As a father, I'm reminded of the way that my children always say, Daddy, look at me. Anytime they have a new trick on the trampoline or they score high on a test. You see, the nearness of Christ means he understands and that he brings encouragement. But it also, mean, it also means correction. The one who sees all, who has eyes like, like a flame of fire, also has a sharp two-edged sword of discipline. A sword that both cuts and heals with the precision of a surgeon. He who purchased his church with his very own blood has every right to rebuke his church, demanding repentance, threatening to remove their lampstand if they do not repent, all the while giving promises to those who overcome. To Ephesus, he says, you have left your first love. To Pergamum, you are full of false teaching. Some of it leading to acts of sexual immorality. To Laodicea, you are lukewarm and I want to spit you out of my mouth. What would he say to us this morning? As the heavenly high priest, Jesus is tending his lampstands, trimming their wicks, replenishing the oil for the express purpose of shining God's light. You see, he is tender and gives encouragement to those who are weak. But he also rebukes those who are haughty. All for the glory of his name. It's his church that will shine the light of his gospel. Did you know that First Baptist Bernie has a lampstand before King Jesus in heaven, our great high priest. And he is in the midst of his lampstands. Because of that, guys, the Holy Spirit 
sent from the Father and sent from Jesus, our great high priest, is with us this morning. He is here. We are his. Now, what an awesome truth. But because of the fact that that we believe the gospel, an orthodox truth that has been revealed through the Bible, Jesus is in our midst. Even though we have warts and all, he calls us his own. And he tends to us. And he knows us. He is our good shepherd. Let me ask you this, guys. As we walk through the book of Acts, did he convict us and encourage us at the same time? Right? Did he stir up your heart for evangelism? I mean, we've certainly seen it. We, we've baptized over the last six months more, more than I've baptized the entire time we've been here. Are you more and more compelled to spend your life for the glory of God's name? Beloved, I hope you see the magnificence of this picture of what occurs when we gather together as a local congregation, that Christ in the heavenlies is near, tending to his lampstand. Next, John is going to give us some vivid metaphors, and he's going to describe for us attributes of Jesus that make certain of his divine nature. All right, but before we jump into the vision and the description of it, let me state this for you plainly. This is apocalyptic literature, okay? This is metaphorical. It is not to be taken literally. And it is not to be drawn. All right, imagine I told you that my wife is as beautiful as a field of red and yellow tulips. That she was as soft and caring as a golden retriever. That she was as strong and protective as a mother bear. Now, if you drew her as some hybrid of tulips and a dog and a ferocious mother bear, all right, she would be less than flattered. (laughs) No, 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 I, I said that she was like or as beautiful as. It's using metaphorical language. It's called a simile. I didn't intend for you to draw her. I was mixing my metaphors. It is the same thing with apocalyptic literature. Jesus doesn't walk around through all of eternity with the sword hanging out of his mouth, okay? Now, again, before we reread John's vision, I want to read for you Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. And recall that that John has has already referenced Daniel's vision by using the Son of Man title in verse 13. And previous to that, in verse 7, he referenced, behold, he is coming with the clouds. But now I want you to pay attention to the description of the Ancient of Days. It'll be on your screen for you here. Daniel chapter seven, verse nine. I kept looking until the thrones were set up and the ancient of days took his seat. Remember, this is in the courtroom. The ancient of days takes his seat. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Now, to John's description of Jesus in Revelation chapter one, verse 14. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it's made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword and his face was, was like the sun shining in its strength. You see, the attributes of the ancient of days have been transferred to the exalted Christ.
Christ. White hair is actually honored in the Bible, okay, as wisdom and dignity. Eyes like a flame of fire mean that he is all seeing and that he is sovereign. His feet were glowing. Is actually as God appeared to Ezekiel in chapter 1, verse 27, with fire and glowing in appearance. His voice was like the sound of many waters, is a direct quote from Ezekiel 43, verse 2, when Ezekiel described God's voice. You see, the high priest who tends the lampstands in the heavenly tabernacle is also the omniscient one, who sees all, who knows all, who understands all. He is the holy, uncreated one who dwells in unapproachable light, the one who spoke the universe into being. Imagine John's church receiving this letter after he's been taken off into exile. What does it sound like to them? That Jesus is the truth above the reality of their circumstances. They are called to lift their eyes above everything that they are enduring because seeing him triumphs over their fear. Out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. When he speaks, all must listen. For he has all power in all authority. And he will one day judge the living and the dead. That means every one of us will one day stand before him. And his face was shining like the sun. There was a brilliance surrounding Jesus. And especially his face. And it was like the fact that you and I can't stare at the sun. Once before on Mount Transfiguration, John got to see that unfolding of the glory of the Lord. And like Ezekiel did when God came before him, John's response is to fall as dead at Christ's feet in worship. Repeatedly throughout apocalyptic literature, we are warned that you are to worship none but God alone. Simply put, to deny the deity of Jesus Christ is to deny the Bible and the only one who can save you. Verse 17 and 18, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Jesus places his hand of assurance on John's shoulder and says, do not be afraid. The last time John touched those nail-pierced hands, it was more than 60 years ago, His touch sends warmth and peace through his entire being. Jesus now begins to proclaim titles of his authority. I am the first and the last. Isaiah 44, 6, God declares, I am the first and the last, and besides me there is no God. The title is equivalent to, I am the Alpha and the Omega of verse 8. The beginning and the end. You see, he sovereignly exists outside of time. Who is and who was and who is to come. Jesus next declares himself as the living one who was dead but now is alive forevermore. You see, he triumphed over sin and the grave and the gates of hell. Beloved, we worship a living Savior 
a living Savior who has the keys of death and Hades. The keys represent power and authority over. He is the one who locks away and the one who releases for all of eternity. Now take a step back and look at the entire picture together. That he who is the high priest and is tending to his churches is also all seeing, all knowing, the eternal one who reigns above it all. Therefore, if he gives to his church eternal promises, you can trust that. Jesus says, to him who overcomes, I will clothe you with white garments. I will give you a new name. To him who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. You know, a promise is only good, as good as the character and the capacity of the one who's making the promise. All right, so if I told you that I will give you a million dollars tomorrow, guess what? I'm not going to because I don't have the capacity. I don't have a million dollars. Furthermore, I, pro- I don't want to give you a million dollars. <laughs> Even if I desire Okay, I don't have the capacity. Secondly, if Hamas makes a promise to you about something, um, I can't really trust your character. But Jesus, who lovingly died for you, has all power and all authority to accomplish everything that he has promised to us. So hear me, if you are in a dark place this morning, confusion and fear block out the sunlight, then you are in a similar spot to the Apostle John, okay, when he was exiled on Patmos. And this vision is a break in the clouds when the sunlight shines through, that Jesus is higher, that he is above it all, that this vision lifts your head and your eyes. Look at him, behold him. It will change your perspective on everything. But that may not be you this morning. I rather suspect most of us are distracted with busyness and getting stretched to the absolute end of our capacity. There's never enough time, never enough money, never enough stuff. Hey, do you want to know the great news? This vision is for those also. It's for those also. That there is a greater love, a greater affection to steal your heart away from the distracted, away from the busyness, and lift your eyes to Him. Because He actually brings contentment. And satisfaction. You know that? Nothing else satisfies. Zechariah was an ordinary country priest. One of an estimated 8,000 in Israel in his day. He and his wife Elizabeth were advanced in years and barren. Twice a year he traveled to Jerusalem for one week to serve outside the temple, helping with sacrifices in the courtyard. But he had never had the chance and been chosen to enter into the holy temple. On this occasion, it was like winning the lottery. The lot fell for Zechariah to enter. Instantly, this became the most important day of his life. Entering the holy place was an honor that a priest was allowed only once, only once in his entire life, and many never had that privilege. 
So just imagine that moment with him. There in the temple courtyard, about to go inside the temple for the very first and only time. His heart is pounding with excitement. His hands get sweaty. His mind is racing as he thinks about what he's going to tell Elizabeth afterwards. Most of us know this Christmas story. That an angel appears to Zechariah when he is inside serving, giving the pronouncement, right, that he and Elizabeth will have a son in their advanced age. And the son, his name will be John. And he will be the forerunner for the coming Messiah. He will prepare the way for the Lord. Now, everything happens as the Lord promised. Elizabeth conceived and was with child. She was six months ahead of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Luke records for us that Elizabeth is the cousin of Mary. Mary is going to come visit Elizabeth shortly after an angel announced to her, the virgin, that she was with child by the Holy Spirit. And the scene is set. Baby John the Baptist, inside Elizabeth's womb, is a Levite. Okay, he's a priest who has been set apart from birth. A razor shall never touch his head. He shall never drink alcohol. He is full of the Holy Spirit. He's been consecrated to the Lord. John will actually be described as the greatest born among women. And then Luke tells us in chapter 1 verse 44 that when Mary comes to greet her, That baby John, inside the womb, leapt for joy. Leapt for joy. Why? Because his great high priest has come. John, full of the Holy Spirit, even as a babe, recognizes through the Holy Spirit that this is not some ordinary baby. This is the great high priest who has come. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we have had our eyes lifted to this magnificent scene of you, King Jesus, of you, that you are the eternal one, that you see all and you know all, that you reign above it all, that you at the same time are tender and kind and near to us as your church, as your beloved, as your bride. And you know us. Imperfections and all. And you tend to us, King Jesus. And we worship you. We say to you, collectively and individually, King Jesus, we, we want to know you more. We want you to keep changing us into your image. We want you to be pleased with us. We invite you to convict us. Because when you do, it's for our good and you heal us. We need encouragement that comes from you to lift our eyes above both our own misery 
and our own distraction. And allow us to see, allow us to behold you. To see you is to be transformed and changed by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church family, as the praise team comes and leads us in a final song, you are invited to respond. If you are here this morning and you have never placed your faith in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, if your eyes have been lifted up and the Spirit of God has begun to stir in you, listen to me. Today is the day of salvation. Come, come, come and find life. Come and find hope. That he has shed his blood for you so that you could know him. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. Please don't leave here carrying a burden on your own. We are a family. We care for one another. If you want to use this stage as an altar to pour out your heart before the Lord, I pray that you would have the freedom to do so. Whatever the Spirit of God has pressed upon you, please be obedient to respond. Would you stand?